Hi everyone, we are super excited to be here with you today to talk about container operating systems. Um, the goal of this presentation, of this session, of today's session, is to sh give you the key elements to get started with container OS. So we are going to introduce some low-level elements, uh, technical implementation and stuff like that, but also high-level uh, concept uh, to understand container OS. The goal of this session is to give you the key elements and to understand why you should use container OS to operate your container workloads. So before going further, let me quickly introduce myself. Uh, my name is Mathieu. I work as a flat car engineer inside Microsoft. Uh, I'm mainly involved in the test automation of Flatcar. I'm involved on feature development and transversal topics like, for example, cluster API or upstream contributions to other projects in the Linux ecosystems. And outside of work, I co-founded the SRE France Association. So with my friend, we're here to organize DevOps and SRE events in France, meetups, and also bigger events like the SRE Summer Camp, which is a two-day event where we organize uh, talks and stuff like that around DevOps topics. And what about you, Timothée? Hey, thanks, Mathieu, for the introduction. So I'm Timothée Ravier, and I'm currently working as a chorus engineer at Red Hat. So I work on Fedora Chorus and Red Hat Chorus, mainly. Uh, and then on the side, in the community, I work uh, a lot in the Fedora community, uh, especially on the Fedora Atomic Desktops. We just went through a rebranding. We were used to call Fedora Silver Blue, Fedora Kino White, and all of those variants. And now we call them all the Fedora Atomic Desktops. Uh, and I also uh, do some work on the KD side, KD developer, working on Discover and other applications. All right, enough about us. Let's talk about before setting up a little bit of context of why we're here and why we're bothering talking about container-focused OSs. So we're here to run applications. Here we, the entire conference is about KubeCon, cloud-native, cloud-native apps, uh, running application inside of containers and pushing them somewhere to run them to get a service out to users, to get a service to our enter enterprise, to sell, or to customers, or to clients. And so those applications, we now we run them mostly on containers, and we need the platforms to run them to deploy our containers, to make sure they are OK, to make sure they run well, to monitor them, to uh, ensure security, all those things. And so, well, we are KubeCon, so here, obviously, we're going to look at Kubernetes and how, to, how all of this uh, fits in. And so, yeah, we run our application in Kubernetes, which brings a lot of benefits uh, around uh, manageability, uh, prediction, uh, all of those things. And for most people, that's just fine. You get uh, Kubernetes clusters from your cloud provider. You ask for a cluster. It gets auto-provisioned. It gets auto-set up. And you start pushing out containers, applications, services, uh, all the things. And you stop there. What we're going to do in this presentation is to look underneath Kubernetes and what's uh, making Kubernetes shine, what the operating system uh, that makes uh, Kubernetes work well. And so here we're going to look at Flatcar Container Linux and Fedora Quest, which are two container-focused operating systems uh, which are great fit for Kubernetes deployments. So of course, the the infrastructure here, our layer, doesn't stop here. You're always going to run that on cloud platform, on your private cloud, on your data center. And so usually you want to have those operating support all of those platforms and also support different architectures, especially AMD64, which is like the classic one, of course, and now the uh, AOH64 one, which is getting more and more popular. So that's why we're here. We're going to look at Kubernetes under the hood and what uh, does it, um, what it takes to run containers uh, efficiently at scale inside of a cluster, and how the OS can actually help you do that, not just be just a component of the stack, but be something that really uh, empowers you to run Kubernetes. All right. So. Let's take a quick look back uh, through time and a little bit of history. Uh, here, it's about 10 years ago, a little bit more than 10 years ago, we got the first release of Docker, which started this whole thing, in a sense, it, which really started uh, the, the thing around containers and the popularity around containers and how we ship them, how we deploy images and all of those things, how we deploy applications inside of containers. And this happened around March uh, 2013. 
a little bit, a little from months after, a little bit while after, uh, the, we got the first release of, at the time, named Chorus, uh, the Chorus operating system, the first continued focused operating system, which also introduced etcd, uh, notably, and used Docker by default. A few months later, again, uh, we got another uh, entry, another entrant in the field, uh, Fedora uh, Atomic Host, which were uh, the Fedora variant of uh, having a container-focused operating system, which also came with Docker, and at the time it came with Docker with a project called Gear D, which was kind of like a mix between having uh, ContainerD or uh, Cryo or something like that, like a component that would help you create manage containers at scale. And then all of this had happened, but we didn't even have Kubernetes yet. Kubernetes happened only at the end uh, of uh, 2014, in September 2014, and that's where our journey starts. Along the, along, the, along the ride, two major events happened. The first one is that uh, in January, 2018, Red Hat acquired Container Linux, the Chorus company, and also the Container Linux projects. And a few months later, the Kinfolx organization uh, started the Flatcar Container Linux projects. So, yeah, that's about the history of our two projects and why uh, we're here and uh, why we're here talking about container focused services. But I've been thinking that a, while, a lot of times already what is actually a container focused OS? Okay, thanks a lot for this great uh, historical lesson. Uh, so yeah, we kept using the word container OS, but what is it uh, actually? So it's an operating system. But in the opposite of day-to-day's operating system, for example, Ubuntu or Debian, um, container OS are designed to run containers. That's it, nothing more. So everything, yes, you can, thank you. Everything inside the operating system is designed to run containers. So you have the container runtimes already available in the system out of the box. Um, you have the kernel, the right kernel module, the right kernel options to run containers in a safe way. Uh, so yeah, you just want to run containers, that's it. It can be single containers, it can be bigger workloads, for example, with Kubernetes. Um, container OS benefits of the automated update feature, which means once you've deployed a container OS, you just want to forget about it. You just want to be able to forget about it in terms of, auto, uh, of updates. Uh, in the opposite of the general purpose distribution, you, where you need to uh, do the actual upgrade, with container OS, it's up to the, the release itself to push uh, the new release into the system. So like, so you can just forget about it, and every two weeks, every month, you get the uh, new update of the container OS. So it's really nice in terms of security and in terms of technical depth. And finally, the last main concept of container OS is the immutability. So with both systems, the idea is to get some nice feature. For example, we can see on the next slide uh, the ability to have slash USR in read-only. Yes, thank you. So for example, if you SSH into a, a, a container OS, you can't write anything into slash USR. So you can write something on Ubuntu, for example, but on container OS, you can't write anything into slash USR, not even as a super user. So that's one of the main features of immutability. And why this, uh, basically all the all the system is uh, image-based, and this image is the slash USR. So the binaries, the libraries, the configuration, the configuration files from the, from the maintainer's team are shipped via the slash USR uh, partition. So with this, uh, yeah, we ensure the immutability of the system, and you can be quite sure that your system has not been modified bet between the release servers and the actual deployment of the instance. Now the question is, how can I provision the system? How can I uh, provision the immutable? So with Container OS, we're using a co pretty cool software which is called Ignition. So you certainly heard about Ansible to provision system. You heard about CloudInit. Ignition is another one. And what is the main feature of Ignition? First, it runs from the init RAM file system, really early during the boot of the system. This is quite handy if you want to do uh, some low-level operation, for example, partitioning the disk, 
or in injecting or removing kernel command line parameters, you can do, the, do this easily uh, with Ignition from the initram file system. In the opposite of cloud init, uh, Ignition runs only at the first boot. So once your instance has been provisioned and successfully provisioned, uh, Ignition won't run anymore. So for example, with cloud init, you need to put some condition. Is it a first boot? Yes, no, do something, do something else in, in case if it's, a, it's not a first boot. So with Ignition, you don't have to think about this. It only applies once at the first boot. And if there is an issue during the provisioning of the instance, for example, if you want to write a file or get a file uh, from a remote location and you can't get access to these files for whatever reason, the, the provisioning will just fail and your instance will run into an emergency shell. So it's quite counterintuitive at the beginning, but uh, once you get used to, it's pretty convenient because you know that once your instance is up and running, it means the provisioning has been done perfectly. Uh, this is an example of ignition configuration. So if you want to have a look, it's a JSON file, and it's declarative. So you just define which files you want to get on the system, uh, which public key uh, for which user you want to add. Uh, you define some systemd units, uh, you enable them or not. So yeah, this is a configuration of a system. You can see that it's written using JSON uh, format, and we all know that we don't like run, uh, write JSON files directly because it's pretty complicated to, to, with the indentation and stuff like that. So we use a handy tool called Butane. Butane is, uh, is, is a tool to use uh, with Ignition to generate Ignition configuration. So Butane uh, has uh, some variant available for Flatcar, for Fedora OS, for OpenShift, for uh, yeah, distro like that. And the idea is to bring uh, an additional layer to generate the Ignition configuration, like so you can easily catch any issue with your configuration. For example, if you use a key that does not exist in the Ignition specification. Uh, you, also some, you also have some pretty nice uh, sugar on top of this if you want to auto-generate some ignition configuration based on some values in the butane configuration. And finally, it's YAML. So it's easier to write, and we are the KubeCon, so everything is YAML. Uh, yeah, so that's it for, for butane, and we can see now how we go from butane to ignition, just using the CLI, and that's it. So we have the butane uh, configuration that is being transpiled to JSON configuration file. So it's not only converting YAML to JSON. As I said, there is a few other elements that are handled. For example, the content of my etc crony.com file uh, has been uh, converted to uh, URL encoded format for easier uh, if you have some character to escape or stuff like that. OK, so now I have my ignition configuration. What am I supposed to do with this? I want my, my container OS to be able to consume this configuration. Uh, so here, uh, we, we do support with Ignition a couple of uh, cloud providers, well-known cloud providers, for example, Azure, AWS, OpenStack, Scaleway recently, um, but also VMware, for example. So once you have your Ignition configuration, you are just going to upload this configuration on the cloud provider using the instance metadata service, IMDS. So it's the same thing as cloud init configuration, for example. You're just going to take this ignition configuration, put it on the IMDS of your favorite cloud provider. If your favorite cloud provider do not have this kind of service, for example, VMware, you can use the guest info of VMware. If you run on bare metal, that's fine. You can also specify, specify a remote URL to say to ignition to fetch this configuration from this remote URL. And finally, we have the instance that want to boot, and the instance is going to fetch the ignition configuration based on some well-known value. So your instance will know if it runs on bare metal, on this cloud provider, or this other cloud provider, and it will know consequently how to fetch this ignition configuration. So this is how we can provision a container rest using ignition and butane. So uh, this mechanism, this kind of feature, uh, has been leveraging uh, li leverage, for, sorry, uh, on many uh, projects. For example, Cluster API uh, used, uh, used this mechanism. So with Cluster API, you can use, uh, of course, Cloud init, but there is a flag that you can enable when you init your project with Cluster API to say, hey, I want to use Ignition provisioning, which means that basically with Cluster API, you can, out of the box, use Flatcar or Fedora OS, for example, or MicroOS that use Ignition. 
Um, to deploy a Kubernetes cluster, you can also use Typhoon. Uh, Typhoon is a collection of Terraform modules that allows you to deploy Flatcar or Fedora CoreOS once again on many cloud providers. So it's just Terraform modules that use uh, butane and ignition configuration. And by the way, there is a Terraform provider for butane. So if you want to use infrastructure as code as usual with Terraform and everything, you can use the uh, butane provider, so, which is quite convenient. And of course, we have OKD and OpenShift that do use uh, this kind of mechanism to provision the nodes. A final note, final word on the provisioning. Uh, as I said, the ignition runs only once at the first boot, and that's it. So if you want to change something into your ignition configuration, what we recommend to do is to scratch your node and start a new one, a fresh new one. So do not try to modify the current node that is running. Just delete it and create a new one with this new ignition configuration. That's it about configuration. Now I want to see how to automate. Auto, 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 ah, sorry. Let's get. <laughs> yeah, how do you do automatic updates? Uh, this is like a kind of a major topic because when we say automatic updates for you know for services, usually the first question that come to mind are like making updates automatic. Isn't that risky? What if the happen the updates happen on Sunday morning when everybody is out from work, like everybody's enjoying their weekends or what if it happened at 6 a.m.? Or um, is, what if there's a bug in the new version that is breaking everything on my cluster? Um, and all of the things. Like, how do I control automatic updates, essentially? It's, the, it's kind of like the, the big question around that. And the idea is that, first, for automatic updates, you need them to be reliable. So you need them to be consistent, always working, and the, the main idea, the main principle behind that is that they are atomic on those systems. And so they are either applied or not applied. You don't get enough updated system. The entire system is updated as an image, and so you either get the new version or you stay on the previous version. You don't get half the update on the system. And that makes them reliable. So you know that when you're going to update a system, you're going to get the new one or, or stay on the current one. And that, makes, that creates a lot of, lot of interesting properties. On Flatcar Container Linux, it's implementing using the AB partition model. Uh, it's a little bit similar to what's in Chrome or um, Android, Chrome OS or Android. You've got two partitions, and you update the partition that you're not using, and then you reboot to use the new version. On Fedora Chorus, it's a similar ID, except of using partition, we have a single file system, and we use OS3 to deduplicate de the files of each version uh, to, to save a little bit on disk space. The main benefits of this mechanism is that it makes updates less risky. The, the main thing is that you always have at least two versions of the system installed at the same time on a node. So when you update and you have an issue, I don't know, there's a bug in run C, hopefully that doesn't happen that often, but sometimes it does, or there's a bug in another component of the stack, and well, you still have the previous version. So you can immediately roll back to the previous version and get your Kubernetes cluster, your systems running uh, straight away, and then take the time to debug issues. So you don't have to debug things in production right away because you know that you can roll back and just cause a reboot. This also limits the risk when testing fixes. So if you get a new version, you got a new upcoming version of the system, potentially adding a feature that you like or fixing a bug that you really want, you can give it a try and you know that if something breaks really bad, you can always go back to the previous version. So how do we make that happen across the stack? Well, the idea is that we also make this safe because we are creating channels. So we're creating update channels for nodes to get updates at a different pace. The idea is that the system itself, there's, there's always going to be updates. So like, we're not done with updating systems. We're not done with fixing bugs. Uh, if you know how to fix things, uh, call me. Uh, but the idea is that there's always going to be the next update, and so we need to prepare for that. And so we're creating channels so that you can prepare and see things come in advance. So, the idea is that we have the alpha, or we call it next, depending on the projects, or the beta testing channel and the stable channel family. And the changes flow through those channels uh, through time. So all the new changes and new features, they get into the alpha channel first. And that's where 
um, you get yeah, new bugs, new, new, new bugs, sorry, new bug fixes, new uh, features, and you get them pretty soon. Once they've been baked in, once we're like confident that the new feature is good enough, the bug fix actually fixed the issue, we promote the content to the beta channel. So a few weeks later, if you're on the beta channel, you would get the upcoming the content from the alpha channel that has been tested uh, beforehand. And then we do that again. We try, we make sure that everything works great. We make sure that uh, nobody found any major problems. And if a few weeks later, again, we don't have anything major to report on this on, from the beta channel, then we promote again the content into the stable one so that everybody gets it now into the stable channel. So what this lets you do is that gives you time. That gives you time to, think, see, to see things coming. So you can run a little bit of alpha, some beta, and some stable on a cluster and see things, see changes progress uh, on, on the systems, on your cluster, and see how that reflects, how that works. So the ideal cluster that we would, uh, we could describe by that uh, is to run a little bit of alpha. So let's say you would run 1% of your node running on alpha to make sure that you see problems as early as possible. But at the same time, if you only have one node normally, that, and if this one goes bad, that wouldn't break everything on your cluster. So that's OK to be a little bit risky on this front. Then you would run like 5% of the node on your clusters on the beta channel. The beta channel already should be pretty safe uh, because it's been running for a while in the alpha one. And so uh, yeah, it should be much safer to run a larger set of node. But still, you wanna, don't want to take risks. So you run about 5% of your node on the beta one. And then finally, you run the rest of the cluster on the stable channel, the one that shouldn't have any major break at all, uh, that had been proof tested from being going through these two previous channels. So yeah, this is like the major way that automatic updates are made safe uh, because it gives us a new time to react to, train, to react to change and to make sure that issues get reported and fixed usually before they even land into the beta channel, ideally. So what happens during updates? So all right, we've got safe, reliable updates. You've got time to react to them. But like when they actually happen, when a new version is pushed to the servers, then all the nodes will query the server regularly and start, start pulling the updates and start preparing it and eventually reboot. Because from the systems, the way we apply updates is that we reboot the system. If you have the clusters and we release new update and all your nodes start updating and rebooting at the same time, that's probably not going to go well because even Kubernetes cannot stand having half or two, two thirds or two quarters, uh, four quarters, no, three quarters of the fleet go down for reboot at the same time. Uh, it's not going to go well. So the ID uh, is that we use reboot coordinators. So we use programs, uh, so it, ha it can either be uh, can either be daemons, uh, so Herlock and QOD are examples like that of, of daemons that runs on the node that coordinate the updates, uh, or it can also be Kubernetes operators that make sure that not all of your nodes on a cluster reboot at the same time. So usually you only want like one or two nodes, depending on how big your cluster is, uh, to reboot and um, wait for them to come back to make sure that they are on the right new version and then start again to reboot progressively all the nodes. So this lets you reboot progressively your clusters and update progressively your cluster. Um, so yeah, you got operators. So Flatcar Linux update operator is, is one example, and there is also the matching config operator that does this as part of the OKD OpenShift projects. You don't strictly need. You also don't strictly need Kubernetes to do that. So you've got support in Luxmix and Linkadi, both daemons on each projects to do those kinds of coordination. So whether or not you have the Kubernetes clusters, you can do those things. The major feature that is part of those demons is that they also support re what we call reboot windows. So that you can say, for example, I don't ever want reboots to happen on weekends because on weekends I don't want to call folks. I want to be, I want to have my reboots happen on my cluster only during work hours during the day, uh, so that everybody is here in front of the computer and can react if there's an issue. All right. So we said 
Container focused OS. What does it mean to be container focused? So everything inside Container OS run as container, as we said. So the idea is to keep this philosophy in mind when we provide new package inside the operating system. The more packages you ship, the more vulnerabilities you ship. So that's why we try to keep only the bare minimum into the operating system uh, to run containers. So if you want to get Firefox or whatever on Flatcar or Fedora OS, there is a big chance that it doesn't get accepted. So most of the time, yeah, we try to run everything uh, as containers. So out of the box, there is a Docker container D runtimes available and also Podman on Fedora OS. So we talk about immutability. We talk about uh, provisioning the system and automatic updates. But now, how can I extend the system? Indeed, there are some edge cases where running things as container is not enough. Uh, for example, if you want to try a new container runtime, if you want to get back to an old container runtime because you didn't get the time to up upgrade your workload, uh, this is this kind of specific use case where you can't run things as containers. Or if you need some specific modules or stuff like that being loaded into the system. So based on this, uh, you can't use containers. So what, how can I use uh, the immutability c features to extend the system? There is no package manager, slash user is in read-only, so what can I do? For example, on Flatcar, we decided to take the systemd6x approach. So systemd6x is a brand new feature from si systemd uh, project. The idea is to mount as an overlay on slash user and slash opt uh, an image. An image can be a directory, can be a squashFS image, can be yeah, anything that's compatible with systemd 6 x And here, you can see how to install Podman on Flatcar. So uh, Podman is not available on Flatcar, but uses systemd 6 x you can use Podman. And one nice thing to say is that we are using also ContainerD and Docker shipped as systemd 6 x into Flatcar, so you can using butane provisioning, deactivate Docker, for example, if you just want to use container D. What about uh, Fedora OS? Yes, on Fedora OS, unfortunately, right now, there's some slight incompatibilities between our ministry and systemd 6 x so we're not using that. We've taken another approach, which is to say but that we call containerous, chorus container layering. So the main idea is that we put the content of the OS, like the entire file system, the entire all the binaries, all the application, all the content, including the kernel and the init RAMFS, and we place all of that into a container. So it's like just like a transport mechanism. You get a container with everything. It, you can also run it, but it doesn't really make sense to run the application on top of that. But yeah, it's more like a transport mechanism. And so as you get a container, you can use container native tools to extend it, to change the content of the file system. So here I wrote uh, an example container file where you start from the basic, the base image of Fedora Core's stable release, and then you had an external repo. So here I picked the tailscale uh, service, the tailscale daemon um, uh, from a friend's tailscale. Uh, you can so install the daemon without permission to install, and then systemctl enable the daemon, and then finally do some cleanups with a special command just just for that for the special containers. As it's a container file, it's like Docker file, you can use any container native tools to build a, layers, a layered version, a layered container image out of it. Uh, so here I use Podman build to create a layered image uh, out of it, and then push it to a registry, and then finally rebase all your node to this image. And at the end, you get a system which has the tail scale daemon, so still the same properties, um, imageable, uh, reliable updates, except now you've customized the bits that you really wanted to have on your system. So the landscape of container-focused OS is not just our two projects. There are other projects uh, here that we haven't talked about, but you can take a look at them. They also focus on kind of the same use case. They have also similar properties uh, with slight differences for each project. Some are available only on some cloud providers. Some are available everywhere. It kind of depends. Some are more minimal than others. Uh, there's plenty of options uh, for you. Uh, but yeah, here we took the focus on the our two community projects, uh, Flatcar, Linux, and Fedora Cores. Uh, we share a lot of the components. Uh, we share a lot of the history, a lot of the legacy. And so, um, yeah, that's, that's what the, the goal uh, of all of this. All right. And uh, thank you very much for attending and listening to us. And here's like the famous Libra forms. And everything.